in 1977, I was two years old. And something happened that would change the face of the United States for the next generation. It was not an advancement in energy or transportation. It was not transformational things like communication or technology. In fact, it was not a positive move forward. In 1977, a U.S. senator convened a tribunal. He was the chairman of a special committee set up to evaluate the effects of diet and human needs. You see, at the time, in 1977, the rate of heart disease had begun to tick up. And the government was getting concerned, and the senator convened this tribunal, and after much deliberation, brought in experts from all over the country, even all over the world, expert opinions weighed in as to the role of dietary fat in heart disease. At the end of this meeting, this tribunal, the committee decided, yes, dietary fat is bad and put together a new set of guidelines and goals that would define or that would lay out best practice for American diet. Over the next 20 years, we would see foods in grocery stores that were labeled as low fat or no fat. Scientific research, research in food and drug companies went into manufacturing goods that were low fat. In 1995, the American Heart Association put out a pamphlet that described the best health habits, best dietary habits for healthy Americans, in, in which it listed six servings of breads, pastas, high-carbohydrate, low-fat foods. See, over the last 40 years, Americans have been focusing their diets on low fat. Did you know you can go to the grocery store and you can buy and consume an entire bag of sugar and it's no fat? In the last four years, since 1977, in 1977, the rate of obesity in the United States was between 11 and 12%. Today, it is almost triple at 34, 35%. As Americans have more than tripled their sugar consumption because sugar on a flavor basis is lower caloric intake than fat is. Now we're beginning to read more and more. In fact, just in the last couple of years, the obesity code written by Dr. Jason Fung quotes literally dozens of scientific, hundreds of scientific studies that connect increased consumption of sugar with increased heart disease, increased obesity, increased diabetes rates. What scientific evidence was used in this tribunal in 1977? What research documented that dietary fats were the cause of heart disease or obesity? None. Expert opinion was used to define that the objective was to remove fat to try and lower the rate of obesity and lower the rate of heart disease. Why start with this story? Because even now today, if you poll Americans and you ask, what's the number one thing you need to do to lose weight? They'll list one of two things. One, exercise. Two, lower their caloric intake. And the easiest way to lower caloric intake is to remove dietary fat. And yet we now know the scientific research is done, the cat is out of the bag, lowering fat and raising sugar, raising carbohydrate intake is absolutely the opposite of what you want to do if you want to lose weight. Yet still, Americans today, right now today, are plagued with this idea. I bring this topic up for one reason. As leaders, as thought leaders, we must make sure that our objectives are extremely clear and are correct. Because a good idea with a misplaced objective will not only not lead to positive results, can often lead to negative results. 
As leaders in energy, I would submit to you that the energy industry might be caught in some of the same groupthink lack of objectives that we faced in 1977 and over the last 40 years in diet. What are the objectives that we're trying to achieve in energy today? We'll come back to that in a second. A book over the last... Over the last 10 years of my career, I have made my mission to become a better and better leader. And as leaders, our job is not to think about our own productivity or our own success, but to think about the success and the productivity of those that we lead. So if I'm responsible for a research team or a corporate R&D initiative or a government program, what is the objective that we're trying to achieve? I've read literally hundreds of books and articles and listened to podcasts, gone to seminars all about leadership and elevating the human experience of excellence. And just this last year, Gallup published a new book written by Jim Clifton, who if some of you may be aware, Jim Clifton was the author of the original Strength Finders program. You can go online and find out what are your key five strengths. This book they based on what they describe as their largest global study on the future of work. In here, they describe that they literally are pulling data out of over 10 million interviews of people from all aspects of work. And I want to read to you one line out of the introduction to this book. And by the way, I got this book because I took my son, my 13-year-old son, Luke, to a leadership retreat with me. And my son, Luke, comes out of this retreat and he says, Dad, this is, this is amazing stuff. And so we start to read together, and he pulls up this book on Amazon, orders two copies for us. The line in the introduction I want to read, after all these interviews, talking to CEOs and chief human resource officers, doing all these interviews, looking at all this data, Gallup concludes that the world's most serious short-term five to ten year problem is declining economic dynamism and declining productivity in GDP per capita. The data out there points to the fact that we live in a society today in which we are less and less incentivized to push the envelope. We are less and less incentivized to go away from the norm. Today in social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of us that are members of any of these, there's a whole lot of celebration of life as a status quo. In 1977, if you were a doctor and you said, I don't agree with this conclusion that the senatorial committee has come up with, you would have been isolated as a pariah. You were not a part of the new normal in terms of diet. As leaders in energy, as research and development goes on all around the world to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year, how do we identify really clear objectives? If you think about the biggest leaps forward that have happened in energy in the last 100, 150 years, there are some really cool ones that most people don't even know about. Did you know if you go back to 1850, the number one oil resource in the world was not in Saudi Arabia or in Texas. It was whales in the ocean. People were paying, adjusted for inflation, $50 a gallon for whale oil. And yet as human centers, human urban centers were becoming more and more concentrated, big cities were growing up, we needed more and more fuel for artificial light. And companies in Pennsylvania decided that they may be able to turn this rock oil into something efficient if they can get it out of the ground and refine it into kerosene. Over the next 100 years, we would see oil companies begin to develop large oil reserves in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Texas. However, this wasn't all there was to say about the new rock oil industry. In the 1940s, one of the biggest problems plaguing the oil industry was what to do with all the waste. You see, if you brought a barrel of oil out of the ground and you stuck it into a typical refinery, all a refinery did at the time was separate, was to distill, much like a distillery separates alcohol from corn mash or wheat mash. 
you would bring in this barrel of oil and you'd separate it. And out of the middle of that cut, you'd get this really nice clear fluid called kerosene that would power lamps very consistently. In fact, John D. Rockefeller became the richest man in history at the time, making sure that his kerosene was standard, regardless of where you bought it. However, they still had all of this waste product. What could they do with all this waste product, all this heavy stuff that they didn't know what to do with? Rockefeller one time referred to all that heavy stuff as that awful waste product. Today we call it gasoline. Yet it couldn't be burned in its current form. So that all this waste product, and how could they convert it to something usable? Yes, they knew, well, we can put it with some catalyst and we can break these long molecules into smaller molecules, but the costs are prohibitive. The catalyst is too expensive. And the time it takes to get it out of these reactors and regenerate it, it's a non-starter. Lo and behold, in the 1940s, a couple of mechanical engineers decided, well, wait a minute. What if we move this catalyst with this heavy ends, this oil product, so that the catalyst is constantly being pushed through the reactor and into a regenerator? And it moves like a fluid. In the early 1940s, the thing that we, today we call the FCC, or a fluid catalytic cracker, was developed that allowed oil companies, refineries, to pump this catalyst through the reactor into the regenerator on a consistent, on a constant basis, lowering the cost of that cracking to a point when it became economical. Many historians, when they study World War II today, would tell you that the development of the FCC was one of the biggest contributors to our success in World War II because with those FCCs, we could convert those heavy ends into high-octane gasoline, which we put into U.S. and British planes. Advancements in energy from 1850 until 1950 were happening so fast that the world could, better, could barely keep up. Engines were developed for cars, fuel injectors that would come into the 1970s and 80s. Movement in energy, lowering costs of energy was changing the face of the world. Objectives were clear. Get me as low a cost of energy as we can get. Because with more access to affordable, reliable energy, the human race is thriving, or at least those of us who had it. So we ask the question today, what is our objective? If I'm a thought leader, which I assume everybody in this room is, if I'm a thought leader in energy, what is my objective? For example, a lot of times people will say today, well, Ryan, you regulate oil and gas in the state of Texas. You guys are the biggest bunch of rednecks on the planet, right? I would tell you that when I have those conversations with people like in Colorado, I hear, well, our main objective is to get off of CO2, lower our CO2 footprint. Well, in the year 2000, the United States pushed out about six, about six gigatons of CO2. Today, the United States pushes out about 5.2 gigatons of CO2. In that same time period, from 2000 until today, China has increased its CO2 production more than the entire amount of CO2 production from the United States. The planet, the rest of the countries have increased its CO2 production by something like 15 or 16 gigatons. If our primary objective is to lower our CO2 footprint, I would submit to you that getting off of fossil fuels is not the right way to do it. Because while we may get off, of CO, get off of fossil fuels in the United States, what that will do is lower the cost of CO2, of, sorry, of fossil fuels around the world because there's excess supply, which means countries like China and India, South America, Middle East will all use it more and more. If you told me, Ryan, our singular objective is to lower the global production of CO2, I would say, great, I've got a very clear objective for you. Figure out how to transport natural gas cheaper than we can transport it today. Right now in the Permian Basin, oil producers are paying companies between a dollar and three dollars an MMBTU, an MSCUF, to take their gas. It's a waste product to take that natural gas. If we can move that natural gas to the coast, put it in a barge and ship it to places like Japan and China, lower their cost of natural gas from six to eight bucks, an M scuff down to 
two or three, like we pay here in the United States, coal will go away just based on economics. If coal goes away based on economics over the next 20 years across the world, we will achieve more than the Paris Climate Objectives, the Paris Climate Accords had set ambitions to do. We need clear objectives. And this is where energy as an industry, energy as a philosophy around the planet has struggled. I'll leave you with this. I was having a conversation with a group of energy econ economists about a year ago. And it's interesting, and these were not political folks. These were people that simply looked at the economics and they said, the problem is, what is we know what the cost of externalities are. When you produce a bit of pollution or you have a waste product or you use fresh water, there are costs of those things and we know what they are. Here is what I believe our objective in energy needs to be. How do we produce the most affordable, reliable energy that this planet can produce, including the cost of externalities? We have to remove the subjective context of green or off of fossil fuels and move to simply put the cost of externalities. What are the costs associated with all the other things with this type of energy? And when you compare them all, drive the cost down and we now have a very clear objective. Imagine the way the world will change when societies today that struggle with healthcare, transportation, and technology development all have the same access to affordable, reliable energy that we do. If we get there, that is a legacy that everybody in this room could be very proud of. Thank you for giving me your time today. Enjoy the rest of the conference.